Well, thanks to Arena Theater, I think we can picture the scene in the opening chapter of the Song of Songs. A teenage girl is engaged to be married to a young man from her village, maybe on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And after a period of formal betrothal, the bride price has been paid, and this couple is eager to join in holy matrimony. Maybe we can imagine the smell of fresh meat rising from an open flame, goat meat, or maybe even fatted calf. The whole community comes out to witness the sacred vows and then to celebrate with the happy couple and their families. It's a, a feast that will uh, unfold over an entire week, seven days of singing and dancing. And so as the festivities begin, skilled musicians tune their instruments and a soloist begins to take up a familiar tune. It's a public expression of a bride's passionate love. And we understand from the words, soon this will be consummated in the privacy of a wedding chamber. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And then soon a bridal chorus takes up the refrain, we will, refrain, we will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love rightly. Do they love you? And then the groom takes up the melody. Oh, most beautiful among women. All of this, I think, is the most likely setting for the Song of Songs. Weddings in ancient Israel, we know, could last as long as a week. Singing was part of the festivities, and surely the Song of Songs was at the top of the charts in those days. For the people of God, these popular songs expressed a communal vision for marriage. This superlative song was written by King Solomon. Or was it? The phrasing of the title reads, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. It's not the, the usual way of expressing authorship. He might be the author. It might just mean that the song was dedicated to him or in some other way associated with him. If he is the author, and we do know from elsewhere in Scripture that he wrote more than a thousand songs, then he must be telling us to do as he says, not as he did. Because this song is all about an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman, but Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And so if he did write this, he must have been writing with the chastened wisdom of his later years when he realized what a massive mistake it had been for him not to be a one-woman man. Here's a book that contrasts with Solomon's life experience. It's giving us not sex as a conquest, marriage as a political alliance, but marriage as romance and sex as the seal of a covenant. And really the vision of this book is intended to stand against as a kind of, it stands as a divine vision for marriage against the idolatries of a culture. And we can include our own culture in that because we live in a time and place that believes every desire should be satisfied. The sooner the better. The Song of Solomon aches with sexual desire, but it secures the satisfaction of that desire within the bridal chamber. How different it is from our culture. We'll see that all year. We're living in a culture that impatiently pushes past anything erotic to experience the pornographic. But here is a book of adult themes under parental guidance, sexually provocative but spiritually pure. And I think to see that, we need to understand this book in the context of covenant matrimony how frequently we will encounter bridal imagery and vocabulary in this book, especially chapters 4 and 5 when we get to the marriage itself. But we're going to hear people recite vows. And we should also recognize that marriage is the only context in which God-fearing people, God people would have celebrated sex in ancient Israel. I like what one commentator said when he concluded that this is erotic poetry set within the ethical limits of the marriage bed. Now, the word poetry is important. 
A love song, and we've seen it displayed for us this morning, is simply a love poem set to music. And so we're going to have to read this as poetry. And for most of us, that seems intimidating. Most people say they don't like poetry, think they have a hard time reading it. But actually, most of you encounter love poetry every day by listening to popular, popular music. The songs we listen to are really poems set to music, and a lot of them have to do with love, many of them about sex. And if you listen to this kind of music, you know it has a way of getting inside of you and becoming part of your life experience, and the words become very familiar, and you reflect and think about those words. It's why uh, sometimes you'll see the lyrics of popular songs on people's profile pages. People are connecting with that poetry. So I think this book may be, even as poetry, more accessible than you might think. You might read the Song of Songs the way you would read the liner notes to an album of love songs, or listen to its message the way you might listen to the playlist for a wedding reception. It tells a kind of story. Uh, we're not going to read this like a short story because that's not quite what it is. If you read it that way, you'll be frustrated by its lack of clarity. We don't even get the names of these people. We just get a sense of the quality of their love. But if we read this the way it was meant to be read, a diary of love songs from a steamy romance that became a happy marriage, then we can enter into its joy. Now the song begins with a breathless desire. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Did I mention yet this is the hottest book in the Bible? Already, the, the first verse, you get the title, and then in the second verse, already, you meet a woman who is on fire. You don't know her name. You don't know the object of her desire. We don't know if her love is reciprocated. We, we don't even know if he knows that she exists. Maybe it's just a CFA, but <laughs> it's love at first sight. And there's such a rapid progression here. Let me just encourage you in the coming weeks and months, just to, it'll, it'll only take you, honestly, 10 or 15 minutes to read this book, and it bears uh, rereading. But notice, even in the opening verses, there's this rapid progression. Let him kiss me, that's third person, to the second person, draw me after you, to the first person, plural, let us run. She wants this relationship to move forward. It's evident her passion not only from the pronouns, but also from the nouns and verbs. Does it seem redundant to you to say, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth? That's the way poetry works, but it also helps to know that in the ancient Near East, nose kisses were sometimes exchanged as a greeting of friendship. This woman is clear. She's looking for a lover, not just a friend. And she finds his fragrance irresistible, irresistible. I mean, it's kind of an ax commercial, honestly. He walks by <laughs> the woman's swoon. She says his love is better than wine. And the word love there, a word for this intoxicating attraction, it is a word for love making. This woman is not just interested in a Bible study with the man she loves. She doesn't just want to go out on front campus. No, this is a relationship that she desires to end in a bedroom. She is looking forward to her wedding night. Now, we're only four verses in, and already... <laughs> We can understand why some rabbis warned the young men in their synagogues not to read this book until they turned 30. <laughs> this is a book that is about desire from beginning to end, desire stirred, desire frustrated, desire satisfied, then frustrated again. It's all about desire, which is one of God's gifts. But like all of God's gifts, and you heard it so clearly in the words of Augustine this morning, it's the good gifts that most readily are turned to sinful purpose. And that makes this a dangerous book for us to read. I won't deny it. It's bringing us close to ecstasy, and therein lies its peril. 
And I think one of the best ways for us to proceed with caution is to read the book closely, look at its words closely, understand the total context. Now, you might think at the beginning here that this woman's language is over the top, but I want you to see carefully here, this is more than a shallow infatuation. Verse 3, she says that the name of this lover is oil poured out, the name. Typically, when people fall in love, they love to hear the name of their beloved. I smile about this. Our family has an old Scrabble set that came from my mother's house, and I think she must have been using it when she was engaged to my father because uh, uh, her new name is written over and over in the box top, Mary Alice Graham Riken. She's trying it on for size. But this woman here is saying something more significant when she talks about the name, because in biblical terms, a name is a reputation. Here she says that name is like sweet perfume and that all the maidens love him as well in this way. And she is praising his character. She loves him for who he is, not just because he smells nice or because she thinks he might be a good kisser. It's, it's everything about him. And her friends agree. In verse 4, a choir of young virgins, the daughters of Jerusalem, Think of them maybe as bridesmaids, or if you're from the South, maybe debutantes. They are here to pronounce their benediction on the man of her dreams. We will exult and rejoice in you. We extol your love more than wine. Rightly do these women love you. None of which, I think, quite fits our conventional categories for romance. Do you think this woman is a feminist or a traditionalist? That would be a great essay question. She boldly declares her affection for someone she loves. She openly communicates her desires, including sexual desires. But at the same time, she expects and longs for a man to provide leadership. She wants him to kiss her. She calls him even a king. Consider another paradox. Here is a woman independent enough to have desires of her own and to pursue them. This is not an arranged marriage. She knows what she wants in a man. She knows which man she happens to want. But she will pursue this relationship in the context of a faith community. She wants the people around her, especially godly women, to bless and celebrate this relationship, which is not exclusively private, but is also public. We see so many signs here of a healthy relationship, a partnership of equal passion. And as this relationship develops, this man and this woman do not cut themselves off from others. They find strength in the counsel of their community. But now there's a problem. There always is when it comes to romance, isn't there? Here's a problem as old as sin and as current as today's fashion magazines, this woman is self-conscious about her physical appearance. I am very dark but lovely. And she compares her skin to the dark and coarse tents of Kadar. And it's because she's been working outdoors. That's what she talks about in verse 6 when she talks about how her brothers made her go out in the work in the vineyard. She could not take care of her vineyard, meaning her physical appearance. And just to be clear, these verses are not about ethnicity. The, the issue here is not racial, it's social, reflecting the beauty standards of a culture in which the wealthy people stayed indoors and the poor people were darkened by the sun. It is, honestly, a kind of Cinderella story of the hardworking girl. This woman believed that she had some natural beauty, but she worried about measuring up to the conventional beauty standards of her culture. Oh, what burdens most women, I think, carry because of body image. The standards vary from one culture to the next, but there always seems to be something for a woman to improve. Get a tan or use skin cream to make your skin lighter, make your hair straight. No, it should be curly. That should be flatter. That should be curvier. There's always something that should be different than it is. The pain of all this came home to me one day 
when I was listening to the radio and heard an actress say that she was afraid to go out in public because she knew that she didn't look as good as she looked in the movies where every flaw was concealed or in some way perfected. She didn't want to go out and have anyone make any comments about her appearance or take her picture or anything like that. And at the time, this woman absolutely was on everyone's short list of the world's most beautiful people, but she was not even beautiful enough to look like herself. I was brokenhearted, I tell you, when I heard that. I, I had to pull off to the side of the road to grieve about it because I knew that it meant that the women I love could never measure up to a standard of beauty that no one could ever meet. This woman experiences that pain and anxiety, that insecurity. And in her inner turmoil over her appearance, she reaches out to the man that she loved, the man she hoped would love her. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. Why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? And here she is revealing a desire much deeper than kisses and cologne. It's a passion more intense than wanting to be carried over the threshold into the king's chambers. She wants to go and be with the man she loves. And in spite, in spite of any insecurity, she wants to see him face to face, unveiled. She wants intimacy. And she expresses this explicitly as something she wants with her soul, not just her body. Understand the deepest longing of the Song of Songs. It's not a sexual partner, it's a soulmate. And notice how the man responds when in verse 8 he finally speaks. And we've been wanting to meet him, honestly, after everything we've heard so far. This man whose love is better than wine, whose name is like sweet perfume, he does not let this woman's love go unrequited. And he responds directly, wisely, protectively, to her insecurities. He, he starts out by telling her where she can find him. He openly invites her to spend time with him and skillfully affirms her beauty, how beautiful she is to him. If you do not know, and he's about to tell her where to find him, but he needs to say this, oh, most beautiful among women. Follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. It's a rural setting, and he's letting her know where to find him. I don't know how to characterize this invitation. It doesn't fall into our categories either. It's, it's somewhere between a guy asking a girl out on a date and inviting her to come hang out with his friends. It's somewhere in there. But what I see clearly is he praises her unadorned beauty. And... Obviously, he's responding to her concerns about her complexion, but he's careful not to evaluate any and every part of her anatomy. He simply declares that she is beautiful, and that may include physical appearance. Later in the book, for sure it will, as their relationship deepens as we get closer to marriage. But it doesn't have to be limited to that. It's just a simple expression of her beauty. And then he reinforces it with a similitude. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots, your cheeks lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Now, I want to say that a man should always be careful about comparing a woman to a horse. <laughs> but I think this guy got away with it. I mean, a thoroughbred is one of the most beautiful animals God ever created. But the point here is not just the horse, it's the horse's adornment. This is one of the mares in a king's stables dressed for parade with an ornate bridle which he compares to jewelry that his beloved wears. I think it may be significant that at this stage of the song and maybe of the relationship, the woman keeps his comments above the woman's neckline. He refers to her face, but even... More subtly than that, he's really only talking about her jewelry. He notices that she has enhanced her beauty. This woman, I think, who is a bride, 
And here it helps to know that in most contexts in ancient Israel, jewelry was not for every day. This kind of adornment was used at weddings. Sometimes it would be community property that would be brought out for a wedding like this. I think the practical application here is it's not just for grooms and brides. It's not just for husbands and wives. I think it's for every godly man who wants to bless any woman who is made in the image of God. When most young men talk about women, they make a lot of comments about their physical appearance. A fair number of those comments are critical. I wonder, what do you think would happen if the men on this campus said, I refuse to criticize my sisters, and I will not let anyone else criticize them either? What would happen if, instead of considering ways that women on this campus fail to measure up to some cultural standard of physical beauty that no woman can meet anyway, the men on this campus saw the true beauty of every woman as she truly is and then built her up with words of praise. I just believe that when men recognize the gifts of women, when they respect their intellect, when they admire their character, when they affirm the dignity of their unique design and then express this verbally, then women in that community are empowered to become more completely the women that God is calling them to become. And then take it one step farther. Because this man is addressing two concerns. It's, yes, body image, but it's also intimacy. What if men on this campus took the initiative to invite their sisters in Christ into meaningful relationships? I'm not just talking about improving the dating scene, although I'm all for that. <laughs> but I'm talking about the power of genuine intimacy in Christian relationship. Just leave romance out of it for a moment. When men and women pursue open, caring friendships and take time for deeper conversations, they strengthen one another for effective service in the kingdom of God. Men of Wheaton College, look for the true beauty of the women on this campus. I can't help but notice that this is glam day. For South, maybe you've seen the beautiful dresses and the sashes. We're just having fun with it, with beauty and cultural attitudes about it. But doesn't it give you a clue that every woman on this campus desires to be seen as beautiful? Doesn't it say that? Choose affirmation over criticism. Pursue spiritual friendship. It's not just their lives that will be transformed. It will be your life as well. And then let me close with this, and we may run a little long today. I just want to draw a brief comparison to our relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to show you the wider context here. The Song of Songs paints an idealized picture of any man or woman in love, or at least a godly man and a godly woman that want to put love in the context of marriage as part of their surrender to God. But this, this picture is painted on a bigger canvas. Because the Bible, we, we saw this last month, uses marital imagery to describe God's love for his people. We started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's a kind of trailer for the, the epic romance that ends with the Son of God marrying his beautiful bride, the church. And here we have in the Song of Songs the soundtrack for that story. It doesn't mean we should treat the book as an allegory in which everything stands for something else, like some sort of secret code. Maybe the most famous example comes from Cyril of Alexandria, who took that sachet of myrrh lying between two breasts in verse 13. He said, this refers to Christ and the soul of the believer lying between the two commands to love God and one's neighbor. <laughs> I, I have a lot of sympathy for that approach. I really sympathize with poor Bernard, who delivered 86 sermons on this book to the chaste and perhaps astonished monks of Clairvaux. <laughs> but it's, it's not an allegory like that, it, but it's part of a bigger mystery. It's part of the big story, the mystery of the Father's love in Christ for his beloved and beautiful bride. And so we, we, we hear the song, it's not just a man who loves a woman, it's about the love of all loves. One old commentator puzzled over the book, he said, it's a lock for which the key has been lost. 
And I think the key is the revelation of Jesus Christ as the loving husband of the people of God who wants to share his love with every one of us, male or female, married or single. This is the in invitation to love. By the grace of God, we discover that the name of Jesus is oil poured out. His cross is the fragrance of redemption. We were made beautiful and yet we hesitate because our lives are darkened by sin, including the disordered desires of our broken sexuality. But his affirmation to us is the gospel in which he declares that he loves us and has given himself up for us. And because of which he now wants to satisfy our soul's panting desire to be intimate with the living God. He is going to prepare a place where we can go and be with him forever. And as we long for his presence with what I hope for me and for you will grow into a kind of aching desire in which Jesus becomes the one that you want most of all as you wait for that consummation. Already join with the people of God in celebrating his undying love. And as the singers come up to help us, Lord Christ, we will exalt you and we will rejoice in you and we will extol your love.